Welcome back to Release TV. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the support. Honestly, the feedback has been outstanding. Um, I think one of the things that uh, people have enjoyed is that we're, we're really kind of having fun with this. And, and um, it's really kind of encouraged people to go through their cellars and open some wine and have some fun with it as well. So not like we really need an excuse to open wine, but it's nice to have one. Kind of what we get paid to do. Um, once again, we're going to go through a flight of wines today. You're going to have fun with this. Uh, they're all going to be available. Of the wines we're going to show you today, the 2000 Syrah is probably going to be the trickiest one. There's not much of that left on the planet. Um, for those of you uh, who have forgotten, Cubby Lion, my, uh, my co-host mm -hmm. today. Hello in social media TV land. <laughs> we are going to talk a little bit today about vintages that did not get as much enthusiastic press as some of the other vintages. And it's going to be, we're going to try to squeeze this into 30 minutes, but it's a much deeper conversation. So we can continue this thread with Q&A after the show even logs off. You're welcome to continue to send that Q&A via the, the Instagram. We'd love to kind of keep reaching out and talking about that. Um, scores, ratings, you know, I love the Italian version of rating wine. They call it a biacere. And if you're Italian out there and I mispronounce that, I apologize. Um, but they rate the wine by how many glasses you want to drink by yourself out of the bottle. Yes, so it's either one, two, right or three. Alley. Oh my god, I love the three glass rating in Italy. The three carat is the highest plus. rating. Yeah, absolutely, Sweet. man. You know. Um, so let's just we're going to talk about the whole nature of good and bad vintages. I want Cubby to really kind of run with this today. The thing that occurred to me on the way to work today was, wouldn't it be amazing, okay, if other things got scores like wine did? So, oh, yes. so now I'm in the grocery store and I'm like, do I want to decide between the 94 point apple or the 100 point <laughs> apple? You know? Was it a good season for yeah, Red Delicious? You know, so do, I hear honey crisps are really <laughs> hot right now. Do, do I get a score? Do I walk in the door? That's a 93 point dude, man. You know? <laughs> I think there there is a show that has that concept in one of their episodes, and I found it quite uh, quite interesting. It was almost like you're an Uber, and everybody's rating you with every interaction they have of you. So that's basically what happens with these ratings with wine. It is totally subjective. Yes, the weather has a large part to do with it, um, but then I think you'll find if you have a 98 Zin from Elise that Cabernet kind of dominates the vintage ratings of Napa Valley, but what might be not as great a vintage for the Cabernet grape could be a stellar vintage for a different grape. And I think this 1998 Howell Mountain Zinfandel from Elise proves that with the amazing ripe round fruit that still exists. And I'm not gonna use the word easy, but when we're making, let's say eight barrels to 12 barrels of a wine, and it's a difficult vintage, I think we have a little more nimbleness from an artistic standpoint to create great wines and troublesome vintages. I think if you're relying on a very broad spectrum of vineyards that you're trying to blend together to create that wine every year, I find that those difficult vintages have a much more dramatic impact on that finished wine for sure. Yeah, well said. Um, we can simply choose to make less wine or simply not make a wine from a certain vineyard in certain years. Um, in Europe, it happens <laughs> a lot. So they, they typically have a, a, a concept called declassification. Well, they'll take certain top-end wines and go, it didn't make the grade this year, so let's make this secondary wine. For those of us that, you know, <laughs> shop for cheap Burgundy, the secondary market can be sometimes the greatest entry into Burgundy. Yeah. Right, yeah. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Uh, before we get too far now, you want to tell them about what we're actually starting off with today? Yeah, so back to what we just poured in our glass. This is the 1998 Howe Mountain Zinfandel. Mm. So Howe Mountain, really rocky area in the northeast side of Napa Valley. Beautiful, just wow. common traits for this area. Beautiful acidity, a lot of power, uh, a lot of verve. Um, this particular vintage, I remember back in the day when it was coming out, was the worst vintage of the century, <laughs> according right. to a few of critics, the century, and it followed, it piggybacked <laughs> what was considered one of the best vintages of the century yes. for Napa Valley, uh, the 97 vintage. So we are having a lot of fun with this wine oh, my uh, because it is delicious. The fruit is still there, like I said earlier, round, super sweet, juicy still. Super I mean, this juicy. is really like... 
I would be hard pressed if we blinded you on this. I'd be hard pressed to see if you could nail this for being as old as this is. I'm really blown away by how much dark and juicy fruit yep. is in the middle of this wine. When you put your nose in it, there's no doubt you're going to get that dusty quality. This is, you know, this has been resting for 20 years. Um, but man, that is in fantastic shape. Yeah, I think the dust for you is coming off the bottle that you dripped <laughs> as you were pouring. But wait, we're not all perfect. Um, but yeah, 1998 was considered a horrible vintage for Napa Valley. Um, but we've plugged through some 98s of ours, whether it's Cabernet Sauvignon, which, why don't you kind of uh, expand upon what makes a good vintage as opposed to an That's off vintage? That's a tough one, yeah. You know, and I think it's, I, I was fascinated when you go to like the Napa Valley Vintners website and they talk about vintage. I like that they separate it by varietal. So they show the different grapes responded to those weather patterns. Now, I think the thing is you can't, you get overloaded with information. There's so many different factors from appellation to weather that can affect all of that. Um, the number one factor for us that we see as a trend, like let's say you're looking at one of those, those E-Trade stock reports, green, red, you know, the ups and downs. For us, it's temperature and rainfall, timeliness. Um, if we get the right amount of rain at the right time of year and it's dry the rest of the year and we get a light offshore breeze and then we pick up a little temperature, you know. Uh, if, if you think about the perfect day you've ever spent on vacation, we need like 300 days a year like that. You know? <laughs> That's a perfect vintage for us in Napa. And that is also, if you kind of stick to wine regions as you explore our planet, you will find some of the most spectacular, gentle weather. They call it this Mediterranean climate. You will always find a food scene that kind of attaches itself to that. And so the troublesome years, we will find rain at too high a quantity. For us, it's it's past Easter and it's before Halloween. Anything in that little zone it starts to cause us problems. Uh, one of the big things is grapes tend to, to molt. It's a fruit crop. You start getting rain in the warmer months, you're bringing all kinds of problems into your world. Um, and then it's temperature. Now, I can take high temperatures if I can predict them and they're consistent, we can mitigate and farm around that. If I'm seeing 105 and all of a sudden 75 and then 105, the grape it does this panic mode and it shuts down and it doesn't really develop. And it's hard to understand that at 100 degrees, the vineyard doesn't ripen faster. It ripens slower because it actually droops down and protects itself and goes into this dormancy. So that little perfect window, that that... Goldilocks kind of zone is what we need for perfect vintages. Now, I will confess, and then I'll stop talking, I promise. Um, <laughs> keep going. We often take more pride in a 98 like this than we did in some of the rock star 97s. Yes. Because 97, you didn't get credit for making a great wine. You got kind of made fun of for not making a great wine in 97. Whereas in a vintage like 98, when you achieve a wine like this, I think there's a different swagger. Like, I can pull magic out of any condition. There's maybe a little bit more pride in some of these complicated vintages, I think. I, I definitely agree. Um, Were either of you in Napa Valley in 1998? Oh, good question. Thank you for the shout out. <laughs> uh, gives me something to talk about. What was I doing in 98? And then you can recall what you were doing. I know you're ready. You're always ready. Uh, so I was a freshman in college at Napa Junior College. So I was here in the valley uh, and actually recall snowboarding that winter. And the snow was pretty good because it was a wet winter. Um, I remember plenty of tennis matches because I played for the Napa JC. Plenty of tennis matches rained out. Um, and if you look at the chart for the 98 vintage, you'll see plenty of rainfall early, but tagging back into what Christopher was saying, there was also rainfall in May and June, which kind of held back the vines from budding and then developing early. So what makes it not the greatest vintage for Cabernet Sauvignon, even though some people make exceptional Cabernets, was that the grapes never got ripe because they got a late start. Um, so that's what I was doing in 98. Yourself, sir. I was still waiting tables and, and uh, one of the uh, contributors within the wine program at Trevinia. Uh Working for Chef Kirill back in the restaurant. day, Chef. How's it going Cheers. out there, man? Um, and then one of my friends had just graduated from the Culinary Institute of America 
And when they came west, they were looking to build an events department. And I had the old Christian Brothers uh, and the old Stone Collective Winery known as Greystone here in St. Helena as a raw piece of clay, as a toy to play with. And so we designed an event business around that whole building and did courtyard stuff and herb garden stuff and walks in the tomato gardens and the, wow. the culinary students. And so I would let the students come down and help with plating and service and kind of show them that all the classroom work, this is what it looks like in three dimensions when you've got a bride in your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, uh, if you can't already tell, Christopher is an amazing person to work with and his life experiences are, are super valuable and we're lucky enough to, to work with him firsthand so he gets to share all these amazing structural kind of components of hospitality, of sales, of the wine business, of the restaurant business, of, I mean, he'll pop out with some things about the best way to serve 200 people and make it streamlined, efficient, and he just has lived it, he's done it, and so we're we're beneficiaries of it. Par parachute me into a foxhole, I'll come out with a wedding gig. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my wife and I want to start a, 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 an events company called Smoke and Mirrors. <laughs> you never need to know how we pulled that off, but you just need to know that we pulled it off. Man. I, love it. I love it. The now, things that go on behind I'm going to chat for a couple minutes, and I, I want you to keep an eye as well on what Cubby's doing. This isn't a magic trick where it's sleight of hand, but opening older vintages, okay? This is something where, as a wine drinker, this is where I never am going to promote that you need experience to enjoy wine. Anybody, any of us should be able to grab a glass of wine, and if it's well made and it's delicious, you should love it regardless of how many wines you've ever had in your life. That's always been the appeal of the lease. We are one of those great foot forward wineries. If you're really ready to start going into that next level of exploration, we're the greatest kind of collection of wines where you can watch these little stair steps as your palate kind of graduates to that next uh, uh, kind of level of wine that you want to play with. Um, and so the, the opening of an older bottle though, the cork is always the issue when we come to it as a beverage. Everything else you just snap top, boom, you're in, you know? Yeah. The wine business requires a bit of a ritual, and some of us could certainly have changed our ideas over the years and gone to bag and box formats. We could have gone to screw caps that are very efficient and you have zero spoilage as a result of not using natural material like cork. All of these things, the thing about our business I'm always gonna love is, their solutions are there for us. Do we use them? No. Do you know why? <laughs> Creature of habit. It's the ritual. Yeah. I need that moment, that echo that's happened for thousands of years. Technically not long because they weren't using cork for a lot of those years. It was mostly clay. And you buy by the barrel and just drink, yeah, which is why stand. they refer to the bottom of the barrel because it's delicious when it arrives, but after a couple of weeks, it's not as fresh as it was when it arrived. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. Um, and so the ritual of removing a cork, when it comes to older wines, the cork itself, no matter how well you've stored the wine, is going to be a little brittle and fragile. And the normal little pigtails that you use to open wine will often kind of powder and shred those corks. And I'm telling you, table side for 20 years. Yeah. There's nothing That's... like having that moment where somebody brings an ancient bottle in and you're like, all I've got is this pigtail and I already know what's going to Now, and don't you... get me wrong. It doesn't have to be complicated. If the cork shreds on you and it powders, don't worry. If you simply pour it through a coffee filter and drink it right away, you are good to go. There's no problem there. Um, but but Cubby's got a device. He, he really is, is, is wants to show you this, and I was really impressed with this thing because... It, it, it looks complicated on camera, do not worry, just have fun with it, but it, it refers to the fact that he is going to use this device that almost compresses the cork while you're removing it from the bottle, and that will help you get some of these older vintages removed easily. Um, the other thing I've seen that works really well in these older bottles is there's that device that has the gas cartridge yeah, in it with a needle, and you put this needle through the cork and compress, and the whole thing that. pops that cork yeah. up in one piece. That I've seen work really well in the older wines as well. So this is the only time when you're going to find the wine business getting slightly complicated to get to the beverage, but it's worth the effort to keep the cork intact and, and, and get access to that wine. The wine he's working on is going to be a Syrah from 2000. And Syrah by its nature came into California with all of Australia's popularity reintroducing it as a grape. And it's not grown as widely as other varietals out there in California. And trying to find a farmer that's willing to dedicate himself to this grape, Syrah has the potential to be one of the greatest wines in the world if it's grown well, made well, and aged well. 
They are well-structured wines that have fruit, structure, acidity. They've got fascinating complexity to them. But again, you've got to grow it and make it well. The Elise style here. Oh my goodness. Let's just, for those of you at home, I just want to hear the golf clap softly. Uh, Still undefeated, yeah. this, uh, the Duran. <laughs> so real quick, he'll get back to what he's saying. Remember what you were saying? Too late. Because uh, I have no idea. Um, but this piece of the Durand is known as the Osso, and that is what you'll see sommeliers opening older vintages with in the restaurant business. You, if you're studying to be an advanced sommelier, you already know this, or a master, basically you're going to be asked to open champagne for the service exam or older vintage. And make sure um, you say Osso properly, because otherwise you are going to catch a lot of static over that one, man. What did you call me? <laughs> <laughs> so what uh, what this company, the Durand, did is take the classic Osso and add a corkscrew element to it to stabilize the cork even, even uh, more. So the corkscrew part goes beyond the cork, and then once that's in there, like I already illustrated, then you put the Osso part opposite so it tees up with the corkscrew part and then really it's simple you just pull up i have yet to break a cork which is phenomenal for right. uh for my clumsiness if you mention uh, when you guys order the wines if you mention that you're interested in this device please let us know uh we, we we're not giant when it comes to retailing those kind of things but we have them available and it might be a faster path to get it uh within part of your shipment as well um i gotta tell you right now i just have to jump back in look it if you are fascinated by some of the greatest wine on our planet, well aged in the right location, you've got to jump on this 98 Hell Mountain mm -hmm. Zen. I gotta tell you right now, this thing is in as great a shape as any yeah. aged wine I've had from California. Agreed. I can't believe this is 20. I mean, I'm not even seeing dramatic color change in this thing, yeah. man. So well done. God, that 98 is just outstanding. I agree. And I've had some really good 98 cabs that probably upon release were tight and definitely not a fruit forward vintage for cabs, but I'm amazed at the fruit components of this 98 Hot Mountain um, So now to the 2000 Napa Valley Syrah. One other small thing I just want to mention about older wine. Yes. Occasionally it is important, and I would say the 98 was really, I didn't see a lot of sediment there, so I was pretty confident in that one. The Syrah, we'll find out as we get through this wine. Occasionally what's important is if you're going to open older wine like this, immediately open, especially when you're, with older wine, you've got to open and drink. You know, it, there's no, you can't let this thing go for hours. It really does have that, um, all right, here's a quick comparison. You're in the shower and all the hot water's running out, but you've saved, all right, that last little inch of the dial, right? And you crank it all the way over and you know you've got like 10 seconds left of actual hot water, wow. knowing that that thing's ready to go out. This is what it's like to drink old wine sometimes. You know it's gonna be awesome, but you know there's a clock ticking, man, you know? I like that analogy. Um, you think a lot in the shower, that's for sure. <laughs> or you haven't paid your water bill, all the greatest or your things heating of, bill, I'm not sure what. Every which, man will tell you all the greatest <laughs> things he's ever thought of in his entire life happened in the bathroom. Um, when it comes to these older wines, though, occasionally when you see a lot of the sediment in the wine, if you've opened one and there's a lot of it in the wine, the moment you pull that cork, don't be afraid to take that whole bottle and pour it in one continuous motion into that decanter. Mm -hmm. You're going to drink it anyway, but that just keeps you from turning the bottle left back up and down, which re-agitates all that sediment in the bottle. Yeah. It's just one of those things. I don't even like pulp in my orange juice, so if you want the clear wine, that's uh, one of those nice. tricks. We have that yeah, comment, yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, so this is the 2000 Napa Valley Syrah, so similar to the 98, and eventually when we get to the 11, rain in May, and I think you commented uh, off air before we even did this, the commonalities between these vintages are over an inch of rain in May. October. And October. Yeah. Uh, and all three of these, 98, 2000, and 2011, have that in common. And what um, happens when it rains in October, the middle of harvest? Why is that bad? Oh, good question. I'm going to jump on that so you can catch up on the drinking. Thank you. Because the more he talks, the more I drink. <laughs> um, so, so what happens with rain in October or September? It is a multitude of things. The possibility for mold and mildew to set inside the cluster of grapes because you get the moisture and then it gets hot, like the weather changes or it gets warmer, now there's the possibility of mold and mildew setting in. Um, also, 
all of that concentration that you were hoping to build up throughout the year by getting late rain, you are basically plumping up the grapes with water, which is further diluting that concentration that you worked so hard to build. You poured water in your chicken stock. It was perfect. It was what a great analogy. Yeah. Um, so those are a couple things. Um, Man, what else? What else could we add to that? Because those are two two of the main reasons. But well, I'm sure there's plenty more. What about farming labor? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, define the question. So when rain happens and you can't pick, what then happens when everybody needs to pick on the same? Well, it's, really, oh, it's actually a great, great question. question. The, the biggest thing that we'll do with and and this has a little echo to do with farming more naturally, which is so much more common than it was 20 years ago is I don't have as infrequent a labor force as we used to. We now have an inherent neighbors, friends, colleagues, my goodness, you know, we're all living and, and partying together. And um, in vintages where you start to get rainfall, um, especially during troublesome times of harvest, then you've got a labor force that's inherent because of organics requires year-round labor, is hand-pulling more vines. You're literally pulling more leaves and more material off of these vines by hand because Mother Nature with sunshine and a little breeze coming off the ocean will completely dehydrate that vineyard naturally. And what we're trying to do is create airflow. So a lot of when you see us trellising vineyards and all the shapes you'll see of how we make the vine grow, most of that has to do with opening those canopies and letting air flow through, but pulling leaves by hand in some of those wetter vintages is one of those key. Now, if you look at some of the, the photographs of Europe during rainy vintages, which is a lot, um, they will actually get to the point in some operations where you see them stretching long rows of garbage bag of, of, of plastic material over the actual rows in between the vines to let the water drain out of that vineyard without soaking into the ground and exactly that. We've concentrated those grapes and now you're going to pump them up with, uh, with rain. Yeah, and if I can, I'd like to add on to that because I, while listening, I thought of uh, another thing and it's about that question, that labor issue loosely let's say that a harvest in an ideal world where you get your chardonnay and pinot noir the first to pick for the sparkling wineries and then you get your white grapes and then your reds that you're picking if you're not doing saunier you're picking to make rosé and then the other grapes fall in line but the more spread out it is the easier it is for labor wise but the if you're running behind on ripeness that 90 day kind of window that would be harvest narrows down to, oh my God, we still need the grapes to be ripe, but yet there's a storm coming in. We need to pick before the storm or there's some light rain and it, the weather says it's going to clear up. But now that labor, which we had plenty of to suit the Napa Valley or Sonoma or combined now gets shortened. So now there is a labor shortage. Uh, when comes time for picking and everybody's fighting for that because they need to pick now yeah. the next two days the next six hours and now so we're when the Italians got to Napa Valley the Spaniards the missionaries had left the the um, uh, black figs the mission olives the mission grapes you know they left all this legacy the black mission fig here in the Napa Valley is what the Italians started to notice so in July you start eating black figs, and if they are unripe in July, you know it's going to be a later harvest I that year. That stuff. When you eat those sweet, too, super ripe black mission figs in July, you're like, if I'm harvesting early this year. This is a warm vintage. Yep. So, again, fruit crop. They all kind of have a very similar condition that they want to thrive in, and certainly in the Mediterranean, figs are everywhere. And so it was one of those shared crops that you could kind of see um, the potential for that vintage. So I'm going to tell you right now about Syrah. So that Zinfandel, that 98, that drinks alone. I could sit there and just kill that bottle. That is so juicy and delicious on its own. This Syrah, the first thing your brain does is think food. Mm -hmm. This is gorgeous. This is well-preserved. But it's telling you something every sip. Every time you evaluate this wine, you take another sip going, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't there a second ago. What's going on? Yeah. Like it's releasing yet another uh, flavor when I go into this. Yes, I, I think the, the tannins are well held up. They are not heavy by any means. This this wine is in perfect balance, and oh. I think it's the perfect time to drink this wine. Mm. I was doing a little research on vintages for Napa, even though we kind of know them definitely for Cab, but I, I thought, okay, 2000 for Cab, 2000 for Chardonnay, 2000 for these different grape varieties, 2000 for Syrah was rated super high. 
it was well super high for an off year for Napa, but it was 90, <laughs> 93 was the ratings. I don't even remember who. Uh, I don't pay much attention to ratings, yeah. but mm-hmm. we are doing this show, so I had to I had to look up some people's opinions. So um, ninety three for Syrah, and tasting this Syrah, I can that actually kind of justifies their opinion. So please. that's where I think it's fascinating about good and bad vintages, because when I look at a wine like this, I want to show it against other 2,000 Syrahs mm. from Australia, from Europe, and go, is this mm. rated a vintage according to the rest of the world? Yeah. Or are you going to tell me before you give me that vintage rating that this is the empirically greatest vintage ever, and everything has to be judged against that? So the standard that vintages are judged against, I think becomes the interesting aspect of what makes that number pivotal or important or, and I, and I think as social media has become so much more ingrained in people sharing opinions person to person, rather than being driven by one opinion or one rating on a wine to drive our quality assessment of that wine, I have found a much more broad spectrum enjoyment of wines and less of this that's perfect this isn't yeah. it's been more like i like drinking this wine yeah and sometimes that is enough yeah. i like drinking this and wine i, I think know? that's also what i appreciate a lot about the hospitality business is those of us throughout the country that are in the restaurant business or in the wine business whether it be at a certain winery or studying for sommelier exams w set or the court or whether you're a rep for a distributor and you have access to, you know, the whole world of wine and usually current vintages, but you're tasting a lot of stuff, I'd rather get the opinion of the hospitality professional, granted if they know what they're talking about, because they're tasting a lot of different stuff and they're also not going to blow the smoke of, no, this is what it is. It is, I like these style wines, I like a more fruit forward wine, or I like a more austere wine. So they already tell you where they're coming from. And for the rest of the show, every time he does this, I want you to skull your glass and pour another one. Oh, yes. (laughs) Easter Sunday, so we got a lot of rabbit ears. For those of you that are the right age group, the Bob Newhart game from the old days. (laughs) (laughs) So did did they know that you were 12 while you were playing that game? You know, absolutely, man. You know, it's really funny. I I think sometimes... Wine drinking by its nature, I think what we take maybe for granted, we don't take much for granted, but I think one of the things we might take for granted has to do with the fact that we have accessibility. Yeah, we're fortunate. We get to get to these wines. I don't, I, I, this is the thing about shipping wine across the U.S. right now. Um, From a a passionate standpoint, the fact that you, the wine drinker, has demanded more and more access to wine, it's allowed us to provide you that experience. And, And to have libraries like this that aren't, the ivory tower that you'll never get an, you know, a shot yeah. at. Again, we're never going to open a wine on this camera unless it's available. We're also Some very... of them more than others, but still, it just the ability for you to have access to those wines, I think, is one of the great things about how um, different and how modified the current atmosphere for shipping wine. And certainly, um, in our current environment, sometimes a lot of those wines aren't being shipped and you're not going to your local retail shop. So the ability to get some of your absolute favorite wine delivered right to your doorstep right now, I think is a really fascinating time in our business in that we're well prepared for it. Yes, we're we're one of the more fortunate wineries to have a library that was saved with this in mind, not this particular scenario, uh, global scenario in mind. this but more often. The more you talk, the faster I get to drink. This is <laughs> awesome. I get to go. I did ear this. Ear. I did not do the ears. <laughs> I did not. So oh my I did, God, everybody at home. <laughs> so uh, my family doesn't know this, but I'm part Italian. Uh, apparently, I like to talk with my hands. And if you see my mom, you will. Hi, mom. I think you're watching. Uh, love you. Uh, but we both talk with our hands, and probably why we knock over more oh. things than most. Oh, mommy. Um, umami. 2011 oh, is mommy. a vintage, and we're pouring the 2011 teach in right now. It's one of my favorite vineyards in Rutherford. Mm. Hugh, how you doing out there, boss? Um, 2011 was one of those years, and 98, you know, was one of those years. It rained and rained. And 2011 was another one of those years where, oh my God, the springtime rain in 2011 was just going and yep. going and going. Um, again, if I'm trying to make a consistent larger production wine, 2011 was brutal. Um, 
not only did we have rain that was that heavy, then we had massive heat. I mean, it was just all of the things that you wanted to check off uh, the list of things you didn't want to happen in the vintage. I think uh, 2011 taught uh, winemakers. There's a hey, drink. No, I, just no. it. I just did it. You forgot to look me in the eye while you do it. Um, that's just an internal thing we have going on here. Um, but 2011, because we were behind on ripeness here in Napa Valley, a lot of people did what Christopher was referring to earlier, and that's uh, de-leafing to open up uh, room for the sun to get the phenolics riper. And what? some people... What kind of vocabulary? What? What is phenolics? What is that? Well, wait, wait. Let me finish this. I'm going to go back to you. You can explain phenolics. Start or Scrabble words Sorry. out there, man. Um, so let's say to get the tannins more mature and the skins and everything that comes from it more mature, they started deleafing on both sides of the vine, which meant the morning sun side and the afternoon sun side. What people learned, and I know a few people that had to learn the hard way, that you want to protect the grapes on the afternoon sun side because that's when the sun is at its most intense. So de-leaf on the morning sun side, get that sun exposure to get that phenolic ripeness going. Okay. By the way, for those of you protect. that expected a 30 minute show, yeah. okay, I don't log off because you're gonna miss the 17s. Sorry, sometimes we run over by a few minutes. Um, yes, now, and please, uh, so, all right, let me, let me finish that. Why do you about the 11 Tijan for sure? Um, so, I don't know about this in the Tijan vineyard, but I do know about this in 2011 in Napa Valley. People learned the hard way. They took the leaves off the uh, afternoon sun side, and then it got super hot in September. Baked the fruit to where they didn't have to pick the fruit because the fruit shriveled up and the fell, off, <laughs> fell off itself. So, I know firsthand for, I mean, for probably about 10 different winery slash winemakers that learned a valuable lesson. Don't jump the gun and de-leaf on the wrong side too early because it's Were either of you on the winemaking thing. side in 2011 or helping out? Yeah, uh, 2011, I was uh, what is gloriously known in the Napa Valley as a rat. Uh, and that means that you don't know anything about what you're doing. And so you run around and you scrub tanks and you roll barrels and you clean hoses and... Uh, uh, but the first thing that they teach you in our business is to take every piece of equipment apart and clean it. And then you take it apart and you clean it again. And that way when the first grape shows up and something happens, I can take every piece of this equipment apart and clean it. And knowing how the things work, it, the wine business, it's the thing I love is I've worked for winemakers that we did nothing. We pulled the grapes out of the vineyards, we put them in a barrel or a tank, yeah. and we walked away and let Mother Nature do the rest and just monitored and ran alongside. I've worked with winemakers that want to engineer every single aspect yeah. of our, our business. And the thing I always love about what we do is it's not a singular path. You can actually come at this business from two completely different directions and still create beautiful, wonderful wine. And that's the freedom. That's the artistry. That's that smile that people from all walks of life find in the wine business is whether you were a gardener, a lawyer, a mathematician, a school teacher, a doctor, it does not matter the pursuit that you had in life. There's part of your creativity in your soul that will lend itself to our business and give you that, that vein of creativity that makes a delicious wine. You know? yeah. Well said. Well said. Yeah, this, uh, this 2011, just being open for what now? Well, I guess 30 minutes because that's about how long we're in, uh, has opened up beautifully. There are some, some herbs and that underlying greenness that you're definitely, for the most part, going to get from 2011. But in a beautiful way, this is balanced, complex, there's depth, there is plenty of fruit um, to go alongside. So this is where point. I find that now my desire for the ribeye with this 2011 Tijan, I want this on a bed of those perfect spring green beans. Yep. They're not bitter yet from summer heat, they yep. got that sweetness to them. A little just, rosemary just, oh, just, and butter that you cook them just in. Just snap the ends and just go, man. You know, and that's our favorite thing in our house is we tend to take anchovies and dissolve them in garlic and olive oil and then toss your vegetables into that and you get a savory Ooh. saltiness instead of just overt salt. Um, um, Marsala Hazan, this is to you, man. Yeah, you daddy, my best inspiration in the uh, kitchen. A lover man. of uh, uh, anchovies. All right, let's, uh, because we've been... Uh, enjoying ourselves too much through these 
Oh, wait, wait. We got a drink. Oh, God, you did it again. Bad vintages. Let's uh, move on to... It's not considered a bad vintage, but there's uncertainty of this vintage due to Mother Nature. As of the show on this day, let's replace the word bad with the word challenging. Oh, thank you. Bad vintages have to do with bad winemaking. Good vintages have to do with good winemaking? Absolutely not. I can make a good wine in a bad vintage because I am going to just absolutely polish that vineyard down to the core of what I can find out of it in any given conditions. It's very rare than in any even bizarre weather conditions that we still cannot yield a good wine out of a vineyard. It just depends on how much wine we can make depending on those inputs. But I, I think the good and bad vintage as a concept mm -hmm. is still something that is being declared by people that are not as um, small production minded. I think a lot, the thing that, just a quick explanation, and I know we're running over time. Um, when we talk about these wines of the lease and we talk about these Napa Valley wines, we represent less than 10% of the entire production coming out of the state. There is a lot of wine pre produced less. in California that is delicious entry level wine, and vintage can drive those crops far differently than us artistically growing one and two acre vineyard wines. The benefit of your evolution as a wine drinker into some of these single vineyard wines is you get to watch us react to those troublesome vintages in a really beautiful way and that you will see production numbers go up and down according to our ability to harvest some artistry out of those troublesome years and so when somebody says you know 98 was a bad vintage in the back of your mind yeah. you've got to go well it might have been bad for some guys but yeah. i'm drinking a 98 right now that you know to go back to 2011 as we're moving on to 17 uh russell bevan our winemaker was the only winemaker on the planet, by the way, to get one of those 100-point scores from, from the popular press. Um, troublesome vintage, but we looked at a vineyard and reduced its yield down so low that we found the core, we found the heart, and still produced a pretty magical wine. So we have a question. Yes. What is your favorite vintage in Napa for the last 20 years? Oh, that's brutal. And, and why is it 2019, I guess? Well, yeah. mentioned a grape. Nope. 2019, best ever, man. No. Yeah. I, well, tasting through the Elise barrel samples that we've been tasting through, 2019 is off the charts. Uh, uh, but also, it depends on the grape, too, because I've had 2011 Merlots that blew my socks off. Let's and say for Cabernet. Let's say for 2010. Cabernet. 2010. If I'm going to pick a favorite vintage of the last 20 years, 2010 for me was cool enough to make juicy flavors. It was warm enough to give me ripeness. It was structured. It was, it was pretty much everything I was looking for start to finish. Um, and that's for Cabernet. I mean, God, the the 2016 Chardonnays were fantastic. 2017 for Pinot was epic for us. And, yeah. and talking about 17, hey, by the way, while we're still doing this show, and I know we've run way over, uh, first responders from 2017, man, oh, you, you guys and gals saved 10,000 firefighters and first responders in the Napa Valley trying to help us save this part of the world. Um, it was epic to see the outpouring yeah. of help. And, and also the, from Hawaii, there were a team of, I mean, yeah. from all over. And what doesn't get as much press oh. is the fire, the crazy fires going on in Montana before we even had our fires. So firefighters were already going to Montana. And then they came to Napa and Sonoma and helped out immensely and sacrificed their livelihoods, their families and everything to Bravo. Help we, us, so. we donated cases of wine to recovery charities. We did a, a ton of stuff for our first guys out there uh, and gals. So um, was any of these picked after the fires in 2017? Great question. So, um, absolutely not. The only silver lining we could attach to some of those cataclysmic conditions was the fact that when the fires hit their worst peak, we had harvested about 90% of our fruit and we were in steel tanks. So we were not permeated by smoke. Um, so far, the research that we've done in the vineyards ourselves has proven that all the fire retardant, all the water that was dumped in this part of the country has not been, there's no creosote or uptake in the root systems. We've not seen smoky flavored grapes a year later. Um, some of the other vintage uh, of grapes that had thinner skins that were 
uh, in the Sonoma side, I think suffered a little worse fate than we did by the the winds and the and the thin skin and and not being picked yet. Uh, but for the most part, if there was any blessing um, in in those kind of conditions, it was the fact that it happened after a lot of our harvest dates. The right. only other one is completely selfish, and I apologize for this, but after we have wildfires. We have some of the most incredible mushroom seasons ever as a, as a uh, chef, and as a diner. Regenerating. For the forest regenerating and God, the morale season after some of these fires oh. has just been spectacular. The chanterelle season has just been unbelievable. Morale is my second favorite mushroom. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's an important question. We were not driven by the conditions uh, to pick. It was about the fact that the vineyard was perfect when it was perfect. Um, I'm drinking the 17 going, I, I have a tough time saying this was a difficult vintage. I have a question for Cheryl. Uh, what is the price of this 2017 Napa Valley? Because it is, it is off the chart. $65. 55. 55. 55. Oh, you're in the back. Wow. I'm working here. 55. I got 55 as my right, last so, offer. Okay. So, yeah, you guys... I mean, I almost don't want to sell this yet because it makes our life way tougher <laughs> because we've got to find it, we've got to get it from our warehouse, and we we probably have five cases on site here. These two 17s we're tasting are not due to be released for a while, but i got to tell you, because we're drinking them on camera, they are available as part of this whole thing. I'm telling you right now as wine drinkers, dollars. both of these 2017s are going to last the blink of an eye when it comes right. to a... To a so a this Napa bit. Valley, let's touch on it real quick and get to this Holbrook Mitchell. Yes. Um, tell me what you're tasting right here, because I'm tasting heaven. That 17 Napa for me has got pure... I am walking through a creek bed. I have got pure wild harvested blackberries right in the little, middle of my tongue right now. There is tannin that brings a finale to it. There's an acidity that brings clarity. There is rich, dark fruit. There is fully supported by a savory quality. This is start to finish. When I open a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon, this is kind of what I am expecting. Pound um, for pound, one of the best Napa Valley cabs. And not just talking about 17, just period. Yeah. Try getting a Napa Valley cab for $55. And that's full retail. That's not with the discounts that we're offering on our website. Here's our offer right now on, on uh, Facebook and Instagram. I'm going to get to this. If you're a winery out there in the business right now, yeah. and you make an under $60 bottle of Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, I want you to send it to the winery and we will do a blind tasting and we will put an event together. Cause I'm telling you right now, I think we're able to reset that dial sometimes. The perception of Napa is you have to pay this fortune to get to good wine. Yeah. I don't believe that. Yeah. I, I think that's the case of some of these really amazing vineyards, but this is a remarkable wine. Um, we don't even have to talk price point. I just want to drink this. Oh, that's true. And, but I needed to know the price point because yeah. easily that's a $95. So that's a lease winery, 2100 off the lane. <laughs> don't come visit. <laughs> don't come visit. Unless you let us know ahead of time, we'll have your stuff six feet off the front door. <laughs> but please send, send us your wines because um, I think part of us in our business is to also be a wine oh, drinker. Cool. Uh, and I gotta tell you, as a as a pure pleasure point, this is uh, fantastic. Uh, so I'm I'm assuming if you hold that back up, Cheryl. Um, <laughs> oh yes, cool. Um, so the question uh, is, how much can I get, and how much is available, and when can I get it, and how fast can you get it to my front doorstep? We have to put limits on that, I would imagine. Uh, well, limits are for people that live within limitations. Well, why am I talking about limits? Well, I don't know, man. I say we just I don't live that way. Yeah, I'm just, uh, have you tried this 17 only, Holbrook? My only dilemma is I have to now buy a ribeye on the way home. Thank you very much. You know, like there's no oh, way I can't. you try this one, you may need two horses of steak. Of course, unless you're a vegetarian, then you can go out in the woods and kill a portobello mushroom it's and like, scoop inside of that before coming you know, back, <laughs> back to your car. Yeah. <laughs> like soy sauce. It's going to be beyond yeah. meat steak soon. It, it was funny so. you mentioned soy sauce. The overwhelming sensation from the Syrah on for me as a salt component in my cooking, soy sauce. Yep. It reminded me of a savory quality of that saltiness that I can bring that would really sing with a lot of this. And of all things that Cabernet loves as well, tarragon. Who knew? Well, the French knew, of course, you know, a thousand years ago. Well, yes. Yeah. Look at their cooking. Yeah. They figured that out. All right, so Holbrook Mitchell 2017. I got to tell you, you got to come to the winery. You got to see the terrain we, 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 
we live and, and work amongst, but Holbrook Mitchell, that's the man's name. He is just one of these characters that we get to play with. I tried doing the math, so I can't get the story straight because if he was a swimmer during the Olympics with Jesse Owens, that was the 30s, right? Late 30s? Anyone out there want to correct me on that? So that would make Holbrook a hundred years old, man. Like, he well, he is, could be a 16 year old swimmer. That's very true. That's where I think he was. I think I mean, we think I of think the Olympians as these 18 to 20 year olds, but yeah. I think he was in that early era of Olympic. Anyway, Holbrook He's Mitchell like 90, 91. was an Olympic swimmer. He is in his 90s at the For end sure. of the road. So right where our winery is in Napa, we have this epic farmer at the end of the uh, at the end of the road. And the Mitchell family, the fruit that comes off of this vineyard is just absolutely exceptional. Uh, we have been offering the Holbrook Mitchell Cabernets for years. I still, I mean, there is no better buy right now on the planet uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon. I love, so the vineyard itself holds a little Merlot and Cab Franc as well. We don't typically uh, announce percentages when we make a wine. We simply make the greatest wine ever. And occasionally I'm like, I think it's 90% Cab and 20% Merlot. And people are like, well, that's 110. I'm like, oh, you're one of those. <laughs> oh, God, I did the thing with my hands on Oh, sweet. Oh, I get to play that game. Oh, mommy. Mm. Okay. So, the Napa Cab has a little more tannin structure to it. That one makes me think of the ribeye. This one, this is front porch drinking. This one I can just stand alone and sip. The Merlot has the weight in the mm. middle of your palate. The Cab Franc makes it smell really pretty. So, the weight of this 17 Mitchell... Um, is absolutely fantastic, but this is absolutely something I can just sit here and, and play with front to back. It is a gorgeous wine, wow. and we are very fortunate to really have access to the whole vineyard now. Oh, um, and the front, when it wakes up, the flowers and perfume that come out of this glass, man. Holy Toledo. All right, so, lean closer. Lean closer yeah. to your cameras and your phone. That's that smell of vision. Anyone, anyone getting that yet? Hopefully that works on know. Facebook because apparently we didn't subscribe to the. Uh, so we do Instagram. a virtual tasting here at the, at the Elise Winery so you can log on to the website and you can put together a collection of wines, have it shipped to your home. And what's really been fun is we're seeing them shipped to a lot of friends' homes. And then we all log on to, to Zoom together and we start doing these virtual tastings. So last night I'm doing this tasting with one of our clients. And it was, they had baked fresh bread. And they kept holding it up to the camera on the computer. Like, smell the Is it coming through yet? Can you get that fresh, crusty bread through the, you know? So we have two questions. Yes. Um, which I'm going to help answer. You can't see my face because I'm behind the camera, but I'm Cheryl. Oh, by the way, for those of you, yeah. do you oh. hear that voice? Just so you know, there's a lot of women involved in what we do. Like, you know, a lot of women, us are set being God and dogma. Winery. It's pretty much the same thing. Nice. Um, but Ooh, so, excellent reference for you, <laughs> more set fans. So uh, one of the questions was, how do you see the wines changing from the course in days to present? Okay. Um, one thing for all of you know, at least has always been a fruit forward winery, and I think you're always going to find that the spirit's the same. Russell does love his extraction a little more, and he does love his new French oak, which means that some of the wines that maybe were traditionally twenty percent might be a little bit closer to forty percent, like our Chardonnay program, and for the Cabernets. We're really going to be experimenting on how much oak we want to put on some of these incredible vineyards. Um, but in general, you're just going to see a, a slightly more uh, you know, hedonistic style, I would say. If very, I very pick subtle a word, I think treatment. the word that we changed was patience. Yes, and you can drink them right away. Yeah. Yeah. So, some of the original wines here at Elise were gorgeous, but they required patience. Six years. They're the absolutely, and I respect that. I got to say, from an international winemaking standpoint, that is the way the word We're the works. beneficiary of it now. Yeah, absolutely. And... What I have been continually proven wrong on is our deeper, denser, hedonistic approach to making these wines does not mean that it robs its ageability. I have loved some of Russell's uh, 08s, you know, and here we are coming into their decade plus aging and the wine hasn't changed color. The intensity has not backed off. The hedonistic pleasure has not uh, subdued at all. So in terms of the future, yes, you in the back. No. Oh. Oh, so then in terms of the future, the 2017s are your perfect year to experience a hybrid because Ray yes. Corson made the wines and then Russell ben Bevan blended them. And he is, to our earlier point of Russell having the only 100 point wine in the world in 2011, an absolutely amazing blender. Oh. And we encourage you to try some of these 17s because it's going to be the perfect bridge for you 
to see a little bit of the past and the present. It's a very, very special vintage for us. It's just exciting for me to even see these wines, you know, up on the stage today and, and get to watch people try it because we couldn't be more excited. Uh, th they are well, remarkable. Said, now, I'm just going to tell you right now, as a, as a predator out there that's already got a garage full of toilet paper, thank you very much for those of us that can't get any. Um, <laughs> Jump on these 17s, man. Yeah, I'm telling you right now, when people start tasting these, they will vanish out of this winery so fast. So if there is an alacrity that you should exercise I don't know what that in means. your alacrity. enthusiasms, <laughs> uh, the 2017 is one of those vintages I would get on early, fast, and hard because I'm telling you right now, they are going to vanish. And we're really not good at making excuses. So you call us and we're like, hey, went to Mark Devin Dimley. I'm sorry, we're sold out. Yeah, too you late. Know, yeah. They can't control um, themselves. I'm just saying. So York Creek. I can't remember exactly the vintage we started working with York Creek here at Elise. However, York Creek is at the very top of Spring Mountain, uh, which is a, one of the 16 ABAs, sub ABAs of Napa Valley. It was purchased by Fritz Maytag in give or take, six, 1969, which, what else happened in 1969? Well, I was born, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so nobody was nobody born cares then. about the moon landing. It was all about me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Fritz Maytag purchased um, the vineyard. So if that last name sounds familiar, has something to do with Maytag appliances, has something to do that I later found out when I started working here, Maytag blue cheese, also has something to do with... Ankerstein Brewery because he purchased that at some point. Started it. Did he it looks start? like the, the video is ending in a minute and a uh, minute. Seconds. All right, so York Creek. Uh, <laughs> he bought the vineyard in '69. It's not for Lori's Planted. May cause side effects. <laughs> replanted. <laughs> Thank you. See, but is that a drinking? Oh, thing? Anyway, did it again. Replanted oh. with 25 different varieties. So it's basically across the street from Pride Mountain Vineyard at the very top of Spring Mountain. And part of the vineyards on the Sonoma side, part of the vineyards on the Napa side makes for exceptional acidity. The in quick word on Greek is luxury. He had so much acreage that we were allowed. Normally, if you're going to buy that kind of acreage on top of a mountain, you're going to plant Cabernet. That's what's going to ring the bell for people. The fact that he had so much acreage and was allowed to plant Petit Syrah, Pinot Blanc. And also the Facante. Oh my God, all the Portuguese varietals website is coming Zinfandel. from York Creek. So luxury was the name of the game. So that yeah, was we have a benefit, very so. few older vintages of York Creek Zin, but yeah. a couple bottles left maybe. All right, so it seems that Instagram has an hour limit, so there's only 20 Bye seconds Instagram. left. 20 but seconds. You can check out Thank more about much. York Creek Vineyard on our website. Tuesday? Are we announcing our show on Tuesday yet? No, yeah. it's, a, it's a mystery. Oh, it's a mystery. mystery oh, bag. Oh, oh, Wait, what's okay. the last words for Instagram? Sayonara. Sayonara. Thank sayonara. you very much. Cheer oh, your glass is empty. And mine's not. Woo! <laughs> True sign of intelligence. Holbrook, thank you. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Are we still on Facebook? Good. Yeah, All right. Hey, that, Facebook, yeah. thanks for hanging with us. Because uh, we're going to drink for the next uh, six hours. Uh, to catch up to the Hawaii time. Yeah. Oh, thank you for matching my uh, corkinisms. I like the balance, actually. I'm right? Right? Yeah, we're, we point in all directions. Um, so in maybe closing, or are we going to keep this thing going? We can drink forever, but we're going to say... Uh, well, we want vote-ins. Let's let Facebook vote in what we should taste next time. Yes, yeah, so you guys Ooh, can leave your idea. comments and we'll review and you'll get back with another post on our social media when we've decided our show for Tuesday. Ninja Smoke Palm out. Boom! And pretty much you should just watch Cheryl because he's amazing. <laughs> Bye, Thank everyone. you guys. Cheers, bud. Cheers.